about people that at the very decisive battle of Platea in 479, it took them about 11 different sacrifices until they can receive the positive omens in order to charge. I'm sure that at that point, Pausanias basically probably made up a favorable omen. So indeed, piety might have played, uh, might have played their part. So while the Spartans are basically nowhere near, at least for another day, I can assure you the Athenians were very happy to see a Platean contingent under Arimnistus coming over. The contingent, the number is debatable, anywhere between 600 to 1,000 hoplites. But the one thing that Herodotus is right about, this is everything. This is all the hoplite force that Plantea can send. Athenians are probably thinking, OK, what are you guys doing here? And probably, who are you? And the Plataeans remind them of an event that happened some 90 years before that, in which Athens had been instrumental in settling a border dispute between the Plataeans and the Boeotians. They remembered it, and I'm sure the Athenians are thinking, wow, that is impressive. The Plataeans are there in their full force. They will, for that reason, deserve a special mention within and gratitude within later Athenian history. So here you have, essentially, as you guys can see, two different camps, the Athenian one and the Persian one, essentially looking at each other and giving each other mean looks, or minor exchange of harsh language. Uh, there's a good reason for this, because, once again, reverting to the map, um, it, it, it's a stalemate. The Persians, if you think about it, cannot launch any sort of attack. Their exit is blocked right over here. At the same time, the Athenians hide the higher ground, so therefore, to be entirely honest, any offensive, any attack might be suicidal, especially against the heavier armed Athenian infantry. At the same time, the Athenians, in this case, are not exactly looking forward to a confrontation for two basic reasons. One has to do that every day that transpires hastens the arrival of the Spartans. We don't care how many troops the Spartans send, just as long as indeed they aren't there. At the same time, the one thing that the Athenians are fearing are the two formidable we weapons in the, Persian, in the Persian arsenal. In this case, they're archers, especially when they have a killing zone around about 150 yards. And secondly, and quite importantly, they're cavalry. The Greeks do not know how to counter the cavalry, especially the Persian one at this case. Fifth day, the morning. And to be entirely honest, we are not entirely certain as to what happened. We have, as you guys can see right over there, a mention. And this comes only from the Suida Dictionary of the 10th century AD that mentions Chorisipis, without cavalry. The cavalry apparently was not present anywhere near the Persian camp. So the big question is, where is Waldo? Where is the Persian cavalry? Hmm, many different theories. One of them, and seems to be fairly like taking over, picking up ascendancy right now, is the fact that at the night of the fifth day at Marathon, the Persian commander, Daptis, decided to re-embark his horse, put him on the ships, navigate, or pretty much circumnavigate the area of Attica in order to attack Athens at the rear. This indeed was put down by Holland, as I said, it's becoming a very popular theory. Uh, it just doesn't seem to make much sense. The whole idea of what is keeping the, uh, the Athenians away from the Persians is that the Persians, even at the least, are holding the numerical superiority. Three, two, one. If you decide to take away cavalry and probably some infantry units, that would bring the actual number of troops on the battle line at an equal level. Second, and quite importantly, the idea of attacking a city only with cavalry, because apparently that's what uh, the, the argument it says, says, itself says, uh, is rather, well, again, absurd. Just that simple. That's not the way that the Persians tend to operate. You would imagine an accompanying number of auxiliaries being there. The third is the fact that if somebody decides to take 2,000 horse, or even less than that, 1,000 horse, and re-embarks them on ships, as I said, you would need 80 ships for 1,000 horses. Nobody would have given notice or got this with. Nobody would have noticed, like, wait a minute, the lookouts of the Athenian camp would have said, what are those guys up to? What are those guys doing? It seems, again, to make precious little sense. But importantly, also, and as a last argument for this, it is probable, or in fact, it is stated by Herodotus, that when the Athenians eventually made their charge, the Persians were surprised. Where are you guys going? You are advancing without archers, and most importantly, without cavalry. If the Persian cavalry was gone, that pretty much would have been a moot 
point, the guy sitting next to him would have said, well, we don't have any cavalry, so what on earth are you talking about? So therefore, as far as the Persian cavalry is concerned, uh, it's there. I think it's there. The fact that Herodotus doesn't mention it might suggest that for any number of reasons, and I'll be happy to discuss it later on, it might not have been able or had the time to engage in the decisive actual battle. Quite probably, when it did, it was just too damn late. It is quite probable that they got lost, and I'll be happy to explain that how it happened later on. But nevertheless, it's there. However, it did not seem to have played any major part in the battle itself. As the road was related, there is an Athenian war council, a famous speech by Mithiades, which in this case is trying to convince the rest of the Athenian generals that this is the time to attack, this is the time to charge. The whole story, the whole speech, some people believe might be either embellished, if anything, even fabricated by Herodotus. I'm not going to go into that. But one thing I can tell you is that one way or the other, on the beginning of the fifth day, battle stations, the Athenians are ready indeed to march against the Persians. Now, the echelon formation I'll just discuss in just a few seconds. But going back, and this will give you a very good idea of both the strategic and of the tactical considerations. Now the whole thing for Mithiavis, and the way that he tends to see it, is that the only way in which he can counter the Persian battle line is essentially by thinning or spreading out his own lines to be able to match them in length. The only way in which he can do it is essentially by thinning his center. So instead of the traditional eight deep rank that the hoplite formation will usually operate, here comes Mithiavis and says, we're going to do it with four. Some people even believe less than that, three. A thin center, where indeed you tend to place, right over here on either side, reinforcement on your flanks, operating in this case with an eight rank depth or deployment. The whole idea, by using this particular trick, if you like, is that the Athenians, while maintaining the adhesion in the center, will also be able to avoid any outflanking attack especially if the cavalry is indeed there at the time. This is exactly how the Athenians draw up their battle lines. A simple at them is what Miltiadi says, and this is where the Athenians start charging. And again, this is where the plot thickens. Herodotus specifically states that by the time that the battle started, the distance between the two armies was eight stadia, around about one mile. He says specifically, the Athenians charge at a run. He is so specific that he mentions that I have never before seen an army, a Greek army, charging at a run. So he obviously means business as this. So the big question that survives even down to the very present day, is it possible? Is it possible that indeed the Athenians ran the entire mile in order to be able to catch the Persian front line by surprise? As you can see, it's the stuff that reenactors live for. Starting, of course, with a crazy British colonel, I think, back in the late 19th century, who tried to recreate the entire thing. I will pay very good money to, in fact, see that guy trying to do it. A French colonel who tried to reenact it with his own company of fresh troops. He ascertained, yes, it is possible, although I doubt that ancient Athenians would be able, because of their lack of fitness, God help them, or bless them, to be able to pull it off. Going down to a famous experiment that was conducted all the way back in the 1970s from Penn State, they took football players and they actually put the entire defensive gears, all 75 pounds on them, and they told them, hill, run, distance, one mile. Most of them were not even able of making it anywhere near. The question, of course, and in this case the conclusion, no, not a chance. It is not possible for an Athenian army or an ancient army to actually pull that off. Now, the problem with this, of course, has to do with some of the parameters that always be or have to be put into the equation. This is the point where, indeed, the myth and the reality of Marathon seems to kick in. First of all, weight of Greek armor and weight of Greek weapons. Go through the bibliography, and you guys will probably see figures of the 80 pound, let's say, average 60 to 80 pound weight of the armor alone, without shield, without spear, without any other protective, of course, element, being the average weight for Greek armor. No, nowhere near. 